results in, um, in the late 1960s by the U.S. Steel Corporation in cooperation with WISDOT, Wisconsin DOT. And as I mentioned, it was just updated at the end of 2021 for the ninth edition. And it has a design run option where you'd kind of be starting from scratch and an analysis mode, maybe where you're um, doing some fine tuning towards the end of um, the design uh, submittal. It is a free software and it also, you know, we're here to help you if you have any questions with it or need any technical support. So that comes with it as well. It is a powerful line girder analysis. And, and what do I mean by that? It, it can do both steel eye girders as well as box girders, um, steel tub girders, and they can feature, you know, um, tapering, tapering bridge deck widths as well as uh, linear and parabolic haunches. And it, they're re it's really I, meant for straight bridges per, per Ashdell RFD with uh, minimal skew. And I would, I would recommend kind of up to 20 degrees but I would I would encourage everyone to look at the skew index factor, and um, make sure it's make sure it's idealized suited for for your bridge project. Also, uh, if you're doing this in 30%, it tabulates your quantities below in the output, which is really useful uh, to help you come up with those quantities really really early on as you're developing your costs. So with the new M, with the new um, ninth edition update last year, it now will uh, independently design both an interior girder and exterior girder for the same bridge solution. Cause we want to design our eye girders uh, the same or exterior girder is not going to be something unique from the interior girder. We want the same throughout for the most part um, with some few rare exceptions. And then it will also allow you to independently kind of go in and, and look at each one of the interior and exterior girders kind of fine tuning at the end. It's, uh, it's capable of modeling, you know, various bridge geometries and, and complicated uh, bridge loadings. It has variable kind of tapering loads that you can start and end where you like. And it helps you generate your service two and your strength one moments, shears, deflections, and even your bearing reactions. So you can go ahead and do your bearing pad design. And then the, the user manual, which you can, you can toggle the question mark in the GUI, it'll pop up and it's, it's got a lot of really useful design tips from Mike Grubb and Associates who have about 40 years design experience and a wealth of knowledge about the Ashto LRFD bridge design specifications as he's helped develop uh, section six for, for quite some time. So that, that's also included. So let's keep in mind uh, uh, just a few rudimentary things before we go ahead and get started on the example. Everybody um, kind of, before you jump in the deep end, some things to keep in mind. As I mentioned earlier, these are we, these are kind of we want to idealize our continuous steel girders. Kind of we want to balance the moments as much as possible, and that's to to basically our positive moment in, in the center span is going to equal our positive moment in our end spans, and generally that's about 0.75 to 0.82 of of the the center span length. So that's generally what we're aiming for. Now sometimes our project constraints can't do that, but in general that's what we're kind of trying to aim for. There's also the um, balance, balance in the in the lateral, the transverse direction as well. And in general, we want our, our girder overhang to be about 0.28 to 0.35s of our of our girder spacing on center. And that's to help um, kind of balance the exterior girder and interior girder so that you know if this gets too large, if this is say maybe 0.5. Um, your exterior girder is going to control and dictate, and your interior girder is going to probably be overly designed. So, and if we get too far below this, you know, then the exterior girder kind of controls, and once again, the interior girder, um, you know, would then would then control and be a little bit uneconomical, I would say. Uh, additionally, we don't want our our overhangs to get too large because we have to handle the crash loading, and which dictates our our overhang steel that we need to we need to provide. So it's good to good to keep those in check. The other thing is a lot of times some of the um, the the sort of the proportion limits in Ashto RFD will help you with starting point. So this is the optional span to depth ratios. It's important to note though, some um, state DOTs and local jurisdictions do require these. So in some, in some instances, you can't get any shallower than these. So this is, this provides these ratios up here when you're including the bridge deck and the beam. So it's a little bit of a higher ratio for simple spans compared with uh, continuous spans. Another reason. It's nice to use continuous steel girder designs to help with optimal efficiency. 
And then obviously a little bit lower ratio based on simple or continuous bands when it's just the steel I-beam itself. So that'll get you a pretty good starting spot on at least what my depth is. You can get shallower, it gets more expensive. You can get deeper, usually a little bit more economical. And then with uh, once you know the depth, you know that, then I generally look at what's what's my what's my web thickness. And generally, we're aiming to do without longitudinal stiffeners, so that's generally 12 feet or or less. And we have a, a controlling ratio of 150, where our D over TW needs to be at least that or less. And in general, I'm aiming for 100 to 120 to get a partially stiffened web. And that generally prevents um, unnecessary transfer stiffeners in my design. So that's a really good way to go. And at a minimum, you know, start with a half inch. That's what's preferred by fabricators for handling purposes and shipping. So next are our flange proportion limits. Um, in general, I would say this B over 2T being less than or equal to 12 is the one that kind of controls for me in general. Every now and then, unusual circumstances, maybe these two. But in general, I would say start here. You know, you don't want to be, I would say, less than 12 inches wide and three quarter inch um, thick. That's sort of the, the bare bones, if you will. And that's right out of our constructability document, a really good document to be looking at when you're when you're doing your, your girder design for practical purposes. And then one other thing to keep in mind before we get started on the example is shipping, whether you're pre-stressed girder or pre-stressed concrete or steel, you got to ship it somewhere. So talk with a local fabricator to the project site if it's really accessible and easy, you know, you, you could get up to 215 feet for your field sections, potentially, if they're capable of doing that. Um, however, 80 foot is more comfortable and 80 to 150, I would say is more typical. So it's, it's really good to talk to a, a local fabricator um, just, just to see what your constraints are for the project, as well as how they get it out of the yard and, and onto the interstate, uh, as well as the weight. So, so 20 tons, there's no permit. And if you're over 100, you know, over 100 tons is possible, but the weight also comes with a factor and a cost. So, so be aware of that. And this probably is more for, for eye girders, but, you know, in general, don't be, I'm sorry, uh, tub girders, but don't, you don't want to be six, more than 16 feet wide or 10 feet high, uh, depending on the truck, truck route. And then in general, if you're nine feet or less, you know, you can ship your girders vertically pretty much anywhere. So, so that, that would be another recommendation if, if that fits for your, for your project constraints. So with all that in mind, we're gonna go ahead and jump into our three span continuous uh, steel girder example. And we're gonna suppose that we've already done our preliminary TSNL and our owner is, is, is bought off on this arrangement. And we're, we're gonna assume that we're, this is a river crossing three span continuous where we have a 200 foot center span, 165 foot end spans. This is uh, our bridge deck, uh, typical section for, for, for our bridge. So we have about 43 foot, two inch out to out on the deck. We have a 40 foot roadway. We have three, three foot, one inch overhangs with 12 foot, four girder spacing, four, four girders space on center there. And we have an eight and a half inch bridge deck um, with nine and a quarter inch at the edge of deck for the deck thickness. So keep that in mind for our loading and what we're working with today. So next, uh, I wanted to mention, so as, as I said earlier, when you download the continuous span standards, they come with all the files. You know, and we say this right here that, you know, the assignment input files were provided because we understand, you know, the ideal span arrangements are rarely um, possible. So, so really, but, but does that mean, you know, I can download these and then trust them implicitly? Uh, you could, but in general, I, I would say um, no, because project design criteria are typically different. So I would still go through the work of, of developing my loading and my geometry um, to validate my inputs and outputs. You could also uh, compare the continuous span standards loading with your project design criteria. Um, and, and the other thing I mentioned earlier is these were idealized for the perfect web depth for optimal efficiency. But if you have any, any, any project constraints where you need to shallow that up, you know, that's something to be aware of right off the bat as well as, you know, for our example, we have a 0.25 um, deck overhang uh, to girder spacing ratio. So we're a little lower than the ideal that I mentioned earlier. So something to be aware of. And then in general, I would kind of verify and check everything that I inherit from anybody, whether it's these files or anything, kind of uh, prove it all right and make sure it's all vetted properly. 
So when these are downloaded, this is generally what it'll look like. It'll come to your computer. You'll go to the continuous span standards. You'll select the Simon files. And for our example purposes, I would select the homogeneous solutions. We're using all 50 W material today. And 12 foot girder spacing, that's pretty close to 12 foot four inches. That looks pretty good. And then I selected this exterior girder file, which had 164, 210, and 164. Pretty close. It does have a, a wider deck overhang and a little bit less um, girder spacing. So we still need to, to do some work here. Uh, because design is iterative, typically you don't design a perfect bridge the first time through. I would recommend putting all your uh, design assumptions and loading into a spreadsheet of some kind, whether it's Excel or perhaps MathCAD. Um, that way, if you set it up where you define all your variables, something changes at the end, like it inevitably will, you can then go ahead type in what's changed and generally do it really quickly rather than erasing all your scratch paper or if it had been set up, not define variables very, very smartly. So with all that in mind, we'll go ahead and, and get started on our specific example. And we'll go through all these, these, these menus here. So the first, the first menu is kind of blocked. It's the model tree where we have these, these uh, design tabs to go through. Um, these top three lines, the comment lines, I would just say, Make it something that makes sense to you and your checker. Generally, I like to um, define the geometry, um, the design criteria, perhaps, and just anything that, to help you easily open this file and know what we're working with here. So, so make it something that, that works for you. The next, the next four are really kind of the bridge layouts, if you will. Uh, you can select an eye girder. You can also select a box girder. The number of spans we mentioned, we have a three span continuous. Uh, you, you can go up to, I think, um, 10 spans, I believe, uh, if, if I remember correctly. We have four girders. So we had one less than the um, continuous span standard, so I had to change this. And I think the number of traffic lanes might have been one less as well. We have three where you take 40 feet divided by 12, and you take just the round number of that. We are going to use the, um, the analysis run type here, since we kind of started with the solution already, and we're going to tweak it. Um, this is also where you would select the design feature where you'd have LRFD sign and go ahead and design your girder once you set up um, some of the basic geometry. And these as such are really for the design feature, the design mode of um, Simon. And so this tells you kind of a minimum performance ratio that you want um, to have. And then if it's below that, LRFD Simon will, will revise it and try to make it a little bit more uh, efficient. The performance ratio is essentially the factored demand divided by the factored resistance. So the lower that is, the less economical of a design you have. The higher it is, closer to one, the more economical it is. And then these are the minimum flange and maximum flange thicknesses I usually um, like to input for when I'm running the design mode. As I mentioned earlier, three quarters inch thick is sort of the, the minimum thickness. And then I like to go to three inch max. You can go up to four inch. There's a mill that provides four inch plate. However, I think it's just one. So if you if you stop at three inches, you can always widen up your flanges to, to adjust. Um, you, you'll, you'll have a little more competitive options uh, when it comes for the fabricator getting their plates from the mill. Uh, the next ones really are, are the deck properties. This first one is sort of, where's my CG of my longitudinal deck reinforcement in my deck? And that's considered over the, uh, negative moment region when, you're, when your top flange is in tension and that deck seal can help you uh, compositely in that tension flange. And then we have our distance from our slab bottom to the web top. That's really your haunch. And one thing I'll say, if, if people aren't very familiar with steel bridge design, your top flange is included in your haunch. So that's a little bit different from pre-stressed concrete world. So be aware of that. So the maximum thickness, and then you have some buildup um, in concrete as well. And the last two tabs or last two features really are fatigue parameters on this on this tab. So we have 800 trucks in a single lane per day um, on, on this sort of rural uh, bridge that we're working with. And we want to have 75 years, just like our design life for Asheville LRFD would, would have as well. So next, the distribution factors. You can either uh, user define them or LFD Simon will calculate them. So I've illustrated both uh, methods here even though I've selected user defined, uh, these are the parameters I would input if I was having LRFD Simon um, design this or to come up with the distribution factors. So we have a zero degree skew, 12 foot four inch girder spacing, and then the DE dimension, that's just your overhang minus your bridge barrier width. 
So that lets it know exactly where it can first place a truck on, um, on the deck, essentially. And then select an interior or exterior girder run. And so I've gone ahead and calculated those distribution factors and verified that they are indeed the same ones that LRT Simon is coming up with. So if you're using another software, I wanted to mention this distribution factor. LRT Simon does include this one. It's sort of in a different part of chapter four. It's in the commentary even, and I've seen some people forget this distribution factor, but it's based on rigid body rotation and it's for the exterior girder only. Uh, so if anybody's done, you know, abutment pipe pile design, it's very similar. You load it all up, you kind of take your, your moment and, and, and you, you basically take the whichever controlling case, however lanes loaded um, kind of controls the, the maximum vertical couple you can get. So once again, LRFD Simon provides this and, and runs this one for you. But if you're using another software, I would just verify that it's using, using the appropriate distribution factors because commonly this one will control your exterior girder. Next, the material properties tab. So this is our modular ratio, right? What's, what's our elastic modulus of our steel divided by our concrete uh, using 7.3? What's the compressive strength of our concrete deck slab using 4 KSI? We have 60 KSI rebar. We aren't gonna use a longitudinal stiffener, but if we did, it'll be 50 KSI along with our transverse and bearing stiffener yield strengths. I've selected normal weight concrete. We're not using lightweight concrete, but you can if, if that's on your project. We are gonna use weathering steel. This, this project site um, warrants it. And it's once again, the most economical uh, corrosion protection strategy. So I'd recommend starting there if, it, if it's appropriate. And we are gonna use welded connection plates. That's preferred by fabricators and, er and erectors. Um, but you can also toggle this to be bolted if, if that's what's best for your project. And then the slab meeting criteria 6.10.1.7. This is the negative moment uh, deck reinforcement, making sure you're providing the minimum 1% of your deck area over your um, kind of anywhere for service to uh, tensile stresses. So essentially that's once again in your negative moment regions and that's the control cracking in your deck. We don't want uh, cracks, owners don't like cracking concrete. So next we have our loads. And really I would think about this as kind of composite loads. Um, so this is the only composite loading we have in our example are the two bridge barriers. And we're gonna go ahead and distribute those evenly to all girders, but different criteria. Sometimes it's 50% to the exterior girder, 25, 25. You know, there's some other various ones to do. So, so be aware of um, what your project criteria is. And we don't have a utility loading, but we do have a future wearing surface that we've gone ahead and applied to the entire um, bridge deck in between the, the edges of barriers. And, and then we, we kind of come to our live loading, um, composite loading, and we can select either HL93 and our user-defined vehicle, or we can select just our user-defined vehicle if for some reason we're ignoring HL93. Our live load deflection factor, this is generally L over 800 for vehicular traffic bridges. If we had pedestrians on our bridge, which we don't, uh, this would generally be a thousand for L over a thousand to have a little less deflection tolerance. And then these last ones are really what's my impact factors on my, on my trucks. So as I, uh, we don't have any user defined vehicles for permit two, but if we were considering perhaps a permit truck, maybe some EV vehicles or any super loads, that's where we'd put this, this information in. And you can have up to 40 axles if necessary. The transverse uh, um, stiffener properties tab is, is one of the easiest ones to input. There's only two. Simon will even calculate this top one for you. In general, it's 3D, three times the depth of, um, of, of your web. And then this is an exterior girder. So we are gonna have one-sided transverse stiffeners, but if you have two-sided, you can, you can toggle no here as, as such accordingly. And then the shear stud property step. So LRFD Simon will also design your, your shear studs and come up with a quantity of those for estimated purposes. So I've gone ahead and toggled, uh, yes, I'd like LRFD Simon to go ahead and design those for me. I'm starting it right at um, kind of the center line of my, my bearing at my abutment. And I'm using um, the density of concrete 145, excluding my reinforcement from that. I'm, uh, the, the pitch is the longitudinal spacing along the girder. And I've, I've indicated six inch preference. I don't want less than that in general, if I can help it. 
I have seven and seven eighth inch diameter uh, shear studs that are six inches tall or long. And there's two studs in, in cross section, um, sometimes three or even four uh, if you have a wide enough top flange. So we finished the model uh, tree and now we're going ahead to the span information tab. And um, so, so the first one, the first span always can't be symmetric. You have to define the first span, but if you had a two span that is symmetrical, you could do that as such for, this, for the second span. So the first thing is the span length. That's pretty easy. The non-composite uniform dead load. This does not include your self-weight or your steel girder. Simon will come up with that internally, but it does include, so this would include sort of your, your wet bridge uh, concrete deck, as well as any buildup. I think I have a two inch constant buildup by the width of my top flange. I also have, um, I think 15 PSF for stay in place forms uh, for forming my deck, as well as I have a, I think a 15 PLF co uh, cross frame estimate uh, load. I generally also like to put in a five PLF miscellaneous load. That's sort of to account for my uh, field splices, as well as miscellaneous bolts, miscellaneous connection plates and the like. I recommend doing that. And then working our way down here, bottom flange cross frame spacing. This, this is with respect to the compression flange. So the bottom flange is in compression over the negative moment regions near the piers. So we have a 20 foot cross frame spacing near the pier. And as you can see, our top, top flange cross frame spacing, the top flange is in compression in the positive moment regions. And it, we have a wider cr uh, cross frame spacing there of 29 feet. In general, it's not fully braced in the non-composite, the wet concrete, but it generally is fully braced uh, in the final condition after that concrete is cured and hardened. And then um, also the construction and lateral moment, this is where we'd put our deck overhang bracket loads. Uh, we don't need this for, for this solution because uh, I think we have a temporary bridge that they're working off in the river, but um, a lot of times that is something you'd want to consider and, and add in. Span two, pretty much the same name of the game. The only thing we've changed is the span length. And notice the non-composite uniform dead load stayed the same. Um, the, the bottom flange cross frame spacing also stayed the same. We have a 20 foot spacing on the other opposite side of the pier as well. And then the, the top flange cross frame spacing changed because it's a function of the span length and what's left after the 20 feet is deducted twice from um, 200. So uh, we have a little bit a little bit wider uh, cross frame spacing in our positive moment regions. And then lastly, this is sort of the easiest tab when you have a symmetric span. Span three, we've toggled it to be symmetric. So we're done. Uh, we, we know we can just analyze and investigate span one and, and we're good to go for span three. Unless something of course was different, the span length or the loading of some kind. So now we're done with the span information tab. We finished the model information um, tree and the span information tree, and now we're on the cross section tree. And really, the last one we really um, need to need to develop before we can start investigating some numbers. And so, the first one that pops up is your web. And so, this is sort of everything to do with your your steel agar or web. And in general, my in locations, I like to have each of my cross frame locations are on here, along with my last um, location. And I'll also have my field splice location on here if I can. And that's so that when I go to fatigue design um, or for fatigue, we're held to the C prime detail. That's our transverse billet weld stiffener for our connection plate of our cross frames. That's generally going to control um, with the C prime detail. So I like to just hone in and look at those locations for fatigue purposes. And then just having the, the field splice on there just kind of make sure hey i don't have a conflict with my cross frame spacing right i can see that it's four feet away so my depth i came i actually used the same one from the continuous span standards of 80 inches you can see we don't have a variable uh, web depth we could we could if we if we so choose and um, the web thickness remember i said i like between 100 to 120 for a partially stiffened web for that d over tw Ratio, I think this is about 116, if I remember right. So we're right within that, um, that, that frame of reference there. And then sometimes you wanna investigate if it's transversely stiffened, turning this on and off for shear purposes. And I've already done that and, and, and investigated that. And then your minimum transverse stiffener spacing. There's a really slick equation in the user manual for, for how to develop this really quickly. Um, 
so then we're going to our top flange tab up here and we have a field splice location at 120 feet like i mentioned so we have one section it's just constant 16 inches wide by 7 8 inch uh, thick and it goes all the way to the field splice 120 feet then we have just one butt splice at 145 feet um, near it's about 20 feet from the pier and that's how we've done it and as i mentioned earlier this is all homogeneous 50 ksi material um, and 70w does have a higher uh, tensile strength of 70 ksi than the regular grade 50. bottom flange pretty much the same thing uh, oftentimes i'll have maybe one more butt splice than the top flange so you can see i i have one actually have a butt splice in that in that first field section and in general, um, I don't ever want to change widths of my flanges unless I'm at a field splice. So notice I did change widths, but it's at a field splice. So there's you don't want to change widths within a field section. That's uh, kind of a no-no in general. And notice I am getting up to that three-inch maximum, but um, that's that's fine. So next really is our composite slab width, what we're considering here. So this is the bridge deck for composite purposes, primarily for, for positive moment and negative moment as well. So you can see I, I, you have your effective composite slab width you wanna consider. I, we had an eight and a half inch deck, if you remember right. So a half inch I'm considering integral wearing surface or sacrificial deck thickness. And then you wanna put in your, your that 1% rebar um, over your negative moment region, that, once again, with the CG and the amount of steel you're you're having longitudinally, that will um, that will help Simon know um, how to account for that appropriately. I already mentioned that 120 feet is where we have a field splice. So you want to put that there. Uh, one of our other tools, an NSBA splice. Um, so you you locate this in Simon, and actually below in the output, it'll tell you all the input you need for NSBA splice. That's another free uh, tool. That we provide and, and really slick and, and can make uh, field splice design much easier than it used to be. And then lastly is our uh, deck pour sequence, what we're doing for our staging for our, for our bridge deck. And in general, we want to pour our positive moments regions first. So you'll see I've done that and our negative moments last. And that's, that's to control the concrete um, um, cracking again. And, and that's, this, this is a good strategy for doing that. So we've gone ahead and done that for span one. Now we're gonna do the same thing for span two. Same name of the game, it's just a little bit longer span. So in this, this one, I have two field splices, I think one at 55 feet and one at 145 feet. And I think I have an additional cross frame um, just because of the span length as well. But notice same, same depth, not variable depth, and I'm not changing my web thickness. I'm still using 50 KSI. So everything else is pretty much the same. Top flange, we have a field section that's pretty much constant from 55 to 145. And then you can see we have um, one butt splice 20 feet away from the pier. Uh, and additionally in that, in that other um, field section as well on the opposite side of the 200 foot span as well. Same thing for the bottom flange. We didn't need additional uh, butt splices that, uh, compared to the top flange here. Uh, and so, so this is what I've input and what, and what satisfies uh, ASHO LRFD bridge design specifications for the ninth edition. For the slab, we have two uh, negative moment regions now at the beginning and the end. So I've gone ahead and provided steel in those negative moment regions and not in the positive moment regions. You can, it's just not necessary. And then, as I mentioned earlier, our field splices, we have one at 55 feet, one at 145 feet. So we've located those appropriately. The deck pour sequence has one more line because we have two negative moment regions, both going in the second pour after the positive moment region has been poured. So then right before we're ready to uh, run this, I would encourage you to read the user manual on the results control. Um, these parameters kind of have a significance and I've gone ahead and this is, this is what I like to have. I like to look at the final um, design cycle and I like to look at pretty much all the performance ratios. So anything above 0.1, I'd, I'd like to see. And I, I prefer the details report. I like to look at the numbers and validate things. So this is, this is what works for me, but perhaps something um, is different preferred by you. So then we hit the run button. 
And you have really three options for looking at the output in Simon. I, I prefer just looking at NLRT Simon itself, but you can also use XML and even like notepad files. And, I, and what I'll often do is I'll, I'll just copy and paste from Simon into Excel. And with that in mind, you know, I, I, would, I would recommend everybody look at their moments and shears. So you can, you can literally click and drag in Simon and then paste this into Excel and you can plot these, these moments. And you can validate them with our moment shears and reactions table that we have on our website as well. But in general, this is kind of what I'd expect, right? Kind of balanced moments. They're not too much different than, than what the idealized arrangement was. Um, you can see we're pretty well balanced and this, this kind of crosses over the pier like I would expect. And we've only shown one and a half do the symmetry for the spans as well as this fits a little easier on the slide. Next, I do the same thing for the shears. And you can see kind of what we'd expect to see, larger shear demand over at Pier 1 and less at the abutments on the, on the lower end span. It crosses over and we kind of have equal and opposite. That looks pretty reasonable. Nothing too fishy, fishy looking to investigate. So we have something that works and it looks pretty good. So I wanted to come back, show quickly the design feature. So on that first general properties under the model tree, we'd go ahead and toggle the design. And then under web depth optimization way at the bottom there, I would go ahead and toggle yes. And I wanna look at five variations below the start of my web depth. And I wanna look at five variations above the start of my web depth. So, and, and in general, I like to look at a fixed increment, but you can also use a percentage based increment. And in general, I like to look at two, four, six inches above or beyond, you know, kind of even numbers um, in general. And, and we can go ahead and investigate after this is all done. I'm going to go ahead and run this for, for how, how do we compare with the other, the other web depths in the, in the same ballpark. And so this kind of demonstrates what I was talking about, the above variations, the below variations. And here's our solution right here uh, with 80 inch web depth, 362.05 tons. That seems pretty reasonable. You know, and I did open up these other ones. You'll see uh, four inches deeper. And I think eight inches deeper look a little bit less minutely, I would say. And when I actually opened those, they, they were sort of changing some of their web thicknesses and some other things with flanges we wouldn't recommend, like the 16th of an inch, for example. Um, so, so actually, this really is the optimal solution. So I think the continuous span standards had it right to begin with. So that's nice to validate that and see that. And then, so... The most important thing, of course, is, is, is looking in the output and, and looking at your performance ratio when you're using this software. So if you scroll down to the kind of the bottom part of the, you know, you can see we're almost the way down in, in Simon and the output, you'll see the, the maximum performance ratio. If it's not satisfied and it's above 1.0, you won't see everything spit out for the bill of materials. It'll say it's unsatisfactory. You can see we have a 0.956. That seems pretty reasonable, pretty economical. But you'd want to also hone in on the other sections, right, along, not just the controlling one, but, but the other sections along the length of the girder and make sure, you know, the rest of it looks pretty economical. Can we skinny it up anywhere? Uh, can, we, can we do some more optimization of our, of our flange sizes? Maybe come talk to NSBA, reach out to a, a AISC certified member fabricator on um, what they think and is there anything we can do to improve the economy of this design further before you submit your final plans? If we were above 1.0, I would then kind of hone in, go to that section. Let's, let's say my tension flange um, over my negative moment region, which would be my top flange, is got a 1.10 ratio. So I would increase the thickness there, for example. If I've gone past three inches, I would think about widening all my flange widths um, in that field section and trying to optimize with the bottom and top flange appropriately. If I have a shear issue, then I'm going to look at maybe I'm going to look at that D over TW ratio we talked about. Am I stiff enough? Should I look at maybe two-sided transfer stiffeners? Maybe maybe uh, something with stiffeners or stiffened or unstiffened considerations. And um, for fatigue, it's always going to be the bottom flange. So increase your bottom flange thickness for that C prime detail, and then you should you should satisfy fatigue. 
The most important thing we do is not our modeling or our calculations, it's what we put on our structural plans that we then stamp and seal as the engineer record and provide to our client and what is used to build. They're not looking at your LRFD Simon file. So it's also really nice early on to develop your typical section, your framing plan. Your framing plan will show you if you had any kind of conflicts, especially if you had a skewed support. You know, your, your cross frame locations can start coming in near your field splices. In general, I want to be at least two feet away from that. If I can help it, you know, you want to avoid framing in that cross frame into your, your web splice. That's, that's, that's a big no-no. So make sure you have at least two feet, maybe even three feet. And as I mentioned earlier, we had um, 29 foot cross frame spacing within span one. Then we had two 20 foot cross frame spacings over the pier. And then in span, span two, it was up to 32 feet. So you can see we have 120 foot field sections, um, field section one and five. Then two and four, 100 feet and 90 feet for that third middle middle field section. And we'd also want to locate where those field splices are. We'd want to label our girders somehow, you know, even our span links on there as well. And then the girder elevation. This is a really good place to look at your, your detail and like, hey, so how else can I optimize my, my, my flange plates? Try to get as few flange plates as possible. It's going to be more economical for your your project so sometimes consolidating even though you're increasing maybe the the, the tonnage slightly can, can still save money on the project so another reason to kind of consult us and the project but i think we did pretty decent here and with that i'd like to say thank you and I, i'll take some questions at the end but